Hi, good morning. Welcome to Rhythms of Grace. My name is Elizabeth Sandifer, and um, I this is my second go around of getting on here. So hopefully I'm I'm good. I think I'm straight now this time. Um, welcome to Rhythms of Grace. It's Friday, and um, I want to share with you this morning. I'm gonna just talk about grace this morning, and um, I've had it's not even morning. It's lunchtime. I guess it's after lunchtime, maybe even. I've had a crazy morning, and um, I had uh, my. I woke up early in the morning, the early hours, with like a horrible migraine, like that came in the middle of the night. And then the medicine I take makes me sick. So then I was sick for like hours after, and then my son forgot his lunch. So it's been like one of those mornings, and then um, some technical issues now, trying to get on here for a while. So um, I'm here. <laughs> And so I'm going to go ahead and just start and share with you what I want to talk about this morning. Um, two weeks ago yesterday was Thanksgiving Day. And um, it's hard to believe that was just two weeks ago. To me, it feels like a very long time ago, Thanksgiving, even though it was only two weeks ago. Um, last year, Thanksgiving Day was really productive for me. For the first time ever, like in my life, I put up my Christmas tree on Thanksgiving Day. This was last year. Um, I didn't even do that as a kid. We never had our tree up that early. And I even played Christmas music last year. And I like that. I like that we had it up so early. And I wanted to do the same thing this year. I wanted to have my tree up early and uh so the day after thanksgiving this year we got the tree we put it up all the boxes were in the family room by the tree and there it sat for like a week uh i did not decorate it it just sat there so i walked past it um, a dozen times a day looking at that barren tree i would walk in and out of the house coming through the door and there would be the tree just sitting there um, and i would see it um, just undecorated and just barren and whenever I would think about decorating the tree whenever I would go to do it I just didn't have any urge to do so I just would look at it plain and I just didn't want to decorate the tree it would just sit there um, and sometimes I would just stand there and stare at it <laughs> because I just didn't know why I didn't want to decorate the tree um, towards the end of that first week after Thanksgiving looking at my tree I started to have this overwhelming feeling of wanting to go by everything new for the tree um, everything from like the tree skirt to the top to the bottom every single thing for that tree and I knew that that was an irrational thought like when I started feeling that overwhelming urge to go and actually do that I knew there was like something wrong and I wasn't sure what was going on um, with me and why was I feeling that way because I love the sentimentality of my ornaments and some of them hung on my grandmother's tree some of them a lot of them are from Sweden and they're old and they're like woven and um, with yarn and and they're so sweet and sentimental to me so for me to even want to think of going to get everything new I was like okay what's going on that I'm even thinking these thoughts um, and as I thought about it and really thought through I realized that um, the reason I was feeling that way was um, in August I lost someone in our family. We, our family lost someone very important to us. Um, my mother-in-law died um, after a short um, time. She was very ill, but she died kind of suddenly. And um, she was very important to our family. And we'd had these events. My husband had a birthday and Thanksgiving came and my little son had a birthday two days after that. And she missed all of those. And all of those felt different. And they felt significantly different for me, these events leading up to Thanksgiving. And um, I realized I wasn't decorating my tree. My tree was sitting there for a week, just barren, standing there in our living room because I didn't want to look at my tree with those same decorations it always had and be reminded that it looks the same when everything in my life is not the same. And it was this very simple thing, but it was this overwhelming feeling that I had. I didn't want everything to look the same when everything wasn't the same. I didn't want that at all. And what I was really feeling is I wanted to hide from Christmas. I didn't even want it to come. I just didn't want it to come because I didn't want the feeling and the reminder that everything was not the same. Now, over the last two weeks, I have slowly decorated the tree and no, I didn't go out and buy anything new. Um, I very slowly, but as I think back to over the last week, over that barren tree that I looked at for a week to how it looks now with the decorations and the glitter and the ribbon and the beads and the bows and the 
all the ornaments on it that make it look beautiful in the lights. Um, I'm reminded of a story that I want to share with you this morning. Um, the story is called The Bet's Feast. Um, it's a story I first heard a little bit over a year ago. I heard it, I first read it in a book from a group we, I was in at church. Um, we were reading this book, Philip Yancey's book. It's called um, What's So Amazing About Grace. And in the beginning of this book, he shares a little bit about the story, The Bet's Feast. So I read a little bit about it. Um, it has been made into a movie in the 80s. It kind of became like a cult classic back then. And um, there was one day like early spring, last spring I was sick and I remember being inside and flipping channels. And I actually on my direct TV like guide on the screen saw the Bet's Feast. I couldn't believe it was on TV. I was because I'd never heard of it that before. Um, I saw it in Philip Yancey's book. And so here it was on TV and I, it was actually like only a third of the way through. So I got to watch the rest of it and I was like, so excited to see it on TV. So I've actually watched part of it on TV too. So, um, but it's it's in this book, which is Philip Yancey's What's So Amazing About Grace. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. But um, so I wanna tell you a little bit about the movie and I can't tell you everything. I don't think I'm spoiling anything for you if you haven't seen it, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. Um, and it's gonna be really hard for me to condense it for time purposes, but I'm gonna try to um, and talk about that with you. So it was written by, um, 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 I gotta find her name. Where's her name? I don't have my glasses on. That's probably not good. But it was written by, hang on. Oh, okay. Isak Dennison. If I said her name right, it might be Isak Dennison. But it was written um, by her. She's also the writer of Out of Africa. Um, so um, she wrote this story. And it's set in Norway, but when they made the movie, they made it off the coast of Denmark. And it was this like small fishing village, this kind of like sullen, grim fishing village. Um, the roads were muddy and dusty and it had these thatched roofs and it's kind of this very sad, depressed like fishing village. It takes place with this small town. Um, one of the main characters is like a father, he's a widow and he kind of um, is a leader in the church and um, it's like a Lutheran church and he has these two daughters and everyone in the town wears black and they're very sullen and kind of like, um, low key and just everything sort of subdued. And the daughters, um, one of them, they're both very beautiful. One of them has the gift of singing. She has a beautiful voice and they're both just beautiful girls. And they kind of spend their days um, doing like church routines and taking care of people and doing good things, um, but without much life. They're just kind of like, everything's sort of dark and drab and overcast and sad in this town. Every day they eat the same food and it's like, they boil bread and they boil cod, like fish, and they put a little ale in it, and that's what they eat every single day. Like even their food is the same every day. And as time goes on, like the daughters, um, they have an opportunity, one has an opportunity to be married, and the other has an opportunity with her beautiful voice to go to Paris and be an opera singer, but they both turn it down. And they kind of just stay where they're at and take care of their father and take care of the villagers and make this, this kind of gruel that they eat every day and that's like kind of what they do with their life and time goes by and they be kind of the father passes away and they be kind of become old spinsters and um one day like many years later they the sisters are living together and at at their door in this rainy evening comes this like gush of sound and knock at the door and it's a woman named babette and she's um she's fled paris and someone that the girls knew, the sisters knew, sent her to their home and said, you know, and there was a note in French and it, and it had said that she, she, she's um, fleeing France, please let her stay with you for like in exchange for room and board, she'll do chores and cook for you. She's a chef in Paris, she can cook. Um, just let her stay with you. She's lost her husband and her son. She's like lost everything she had and she needs to flee because of the war. So they take her in and for the next 12 years, she works for them and um, I'm gonna skip most of the story and just go to the end now because, but it's really good what happens in that time frame. So again, I recommend the movie or the book. So, okay. So over time in this town, like over all this time, the father passes away and the town just becomes more dark and more dim and more bleak. And the, the townspeople, like there's a lot of unforgiveness and there's a lot of grudges that take hold. And there's a lot of people who aren't speaking to each other anymore. And, and there's almost like no joy. And, and there's um, people like really, there's just, division among people and it's like this it's even darker and it's even more dreary and and all of this but Babette continues to live there and cook this gruel she learns how to make what they eat every day and that's what she does and all this time goes by well one day 
she gets the letter, Babette, and she finds out that she's won the lottery back in France, and she's won this great deal of money because someone back there had a little bit of her money and would play the lottery for her every day. And so she wins this lottery ticket, and at the time she wins this lottery ticket, the sisters are planning a big fancy dinner to celebrate their father's 100th, what would have been his 100th birthday, like a celebration for him. And Babette says, you know, in all this time I've never asked you for anything, may I please cook a dinner for you? And um, the sisters are like reluctant because they know that they think French people eat like weird food and they're used to this plain mush that they eat every day and they don't want her to, but they decide she's never asked for anything, will be gracious and allow her to do so. And there's a funny scene in the movie, you'll see, um, where the boats come in with all the food that Babette orders and there's like a living tortoise like, because they're going to have turtle soup, and there's quails, and there's snails, and there's, like, champagne bottles clinking, and the townspeople are, like, horrified. Like, they don't want any part of that. They don't want to eat it. They think it's disgusting, and they're, like, horrified at the sight of this. They don't even want to go to the dinner. Like, they want to reject the dinner. They don't want any part of it. They're, they don't want to do it, and if they do participate in the dinner it's only because they feel like obligated to do so so that's how they approach this dinner so the night comes they invite these townspeople with the grudges and aren't speaking to each other and they invite a few visitors come in like one or two that knew her father and so they begin this dinner and the courses and the meal comes out and they begin to eat this exquisite tasting food and they begin to drink the champagne and a magic comes over the table. And um, so I'm gonna skip, I'm not gonna tell you everything that happens um, right there, but I wanna tell you about the final scene. So they eat this dinner and there's a final scene outside and across the table as this magic kind of unfolds as they're eating, um, there's words of forgiveness exchanged and there's people um, Ex exchanging words of love to each other across the table and um, old wounds are mended and um, and like graciousness is given across the table and all of a sudden there's laughing and there's joy and this is a town where for years has been like subdued and gray and dark and all of a sudden there's laughter and there's there's talking and there's love and there's forgiveness and there's grace happening at that table and they can't quite recognize it but that's what's occurring and one of the final scenes there's two final scenes and one of the final scenes is these townspeople go outside and what is this dark and drab and dreary village, the snow begins to fall and now it's covered in white and sparkle and um, this new snowfall and they're all linked arm in arm and in one, they're all singing a song. They're all singing together and um, where they had division and separateness, they have now become like one people singing in song and um, it's like a beautiful scene. And then there's a contrasting scene they go to and it's Babette in the kitchen and there's a mess around her, like dishes piled up and turtle carcasses and quail carcasses and shells and just a mess of everything all around her. And she's just sitting there exhausted like against the wall. And the sisters tell her, they say, um, we'll remember this evening forever after you've gone back to Paris because you know, you've won the lottery. And she says, well, I'm not going back to Paris. All of my friends have been killed or in prison from the war, and plus it would be very expensive. And they say, well, what about all the money you won in the lottery? And Babette tells them, well, you know, don't be shocked, but I spent every last bit of my money on this dinner. This is what a proper dinner costs at this most expensive cafe um, back in, in France. And she spent all of her money on this on this meal for them. And the, the, um, the, um, Philip Yancey says here, and I just want to share this with you, um, he says, um, Isak Dennison, the author of this story, leaves no doubt that she wrote Babette's Feast not simply as a story of a fine meal, but as a parable of grace, a gift that costs everything for the giver and nothing for the recipient. Okay, and... Um, so it says grace came to these parishioners all around the table. Um, these people that lived in that village. Um, okay, so well, let me just say this. Okay, 12 years before Babette had landed among the graceless ones. They were all followers of Luther. They heard sermons on grace nearly every Sunday. And the rest of the week they tried to earn God's favor with their pieties and renunciations. Grace came to them in the form of a feast, Babette's feast, a meal of a lifetime lavished on those who had in no way earned it and who barely possessed the faculties to receive it. They barely possessed the faculties to receive it. Hi, John Paul. Good afternoon. Um, and so um, 
I think about that story when I think about that Christmas tree of mine, that barren tree, and the contrast in this story between the state of grace and the state of ungrace in that village is so vast and it's so striking. Um, when you think of the ungrace, the dark and the gray, the drab of the food, the way they dressed in dark, um, the beauty gone to waste, the gifts and the talents of the daughters just laid to the side and never, never touched and never brought to like fruition versus the life, the fullness of life after grace touched them during that meal, during the table, um, and the joy that came from it, the extension of self to others over the table, um, which included words of forgiveness and included words of love extended to others. Um, and the closing scene that I described to you where the town once drab and dark with muddy streets is covered in glistening white snow. Um, where people are linked arm in arm and in oneness they sang together this joyful song. And I do think back to my tree, how drab it was, and now I see it with lights twinkling and I see red and gold and I see sparkle and I see ribbon and I see my children smile when they look at it. And I just think of how before it was lifeless, just standing there. And there's a verse, um, in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, and if, you've, if you know the Bible at all, you've probably heard this verse. I don't have it written down, but it's, um, um, uh, His grace is sufficient, um, for His power is made perfect in weakness. Okay, His grace is sufficient. Um, his grace is enough. His power is made perfect in weakness. And when I think about that verse, His power is made perfect in our weakness. Where are we weak? Where do we want to hide from Christmas? For me, I do wanna hide from Christmas. I wanna hide my grief. I wanna hide where I'm still sad from Christmas. And a lot of times I think when we hear this verse and um, his power is made perfect in our weakness, I think it thinks we mean that we must be really powerful. That if his power is made perfect in weakness, then we should be acting powerfully and we need to move those mountains. There's that Christian song we sing sometimes, move the mountains into the sea. And that's true, I think sometimes yes, that happens. But sometimes I think that our power made perfect in our weakness may sometimes be just enough power to allow us to get out of hiding, to allow us to see his grace again. And that's all the power we need because his grace is enough. Everything is grace. It's his grace that changes the table. It's his grace that allows us to extend forgiveness. It's his grace that allows us to speak those words of love to others. It's his grace that allows us to reach out to other people in love. It's his grace that changes mourning to joy. That's what his grace is. And that's what his grace does. And his grace is enough. His grace is enough. And his power is made perfect in weakness. And I think um, it doesn't have to be those big things, those mountains. I think it can just be enough for us to see the, the grace again, to, to be pointed back to his grace. And I just kind of want to um, tell you my own um, Babette's feast story. And this is really short. Um, but I, um, my mother-in-law died August 18th. And so this was just a few weeks after this. I don't remember exactly when, but one morning I had taken my daughter to the bus stop. And it's really early in the morning when she goes, just after 6 a.m. And I'm walking back home, and it's really early, and I was sad, and I was mad, and um, I was full of all these, these feelings. And when I feel that way, I turn inward. It's just what I do. It's like my defense. It's when anything is happening in my life, I just pull in like a turtle. It's just what I do. And I had done that um, for a while. I had been pulled in and turned inward, and um, just like um, probably wanting to hide from Christmas in that tree like turning inward. And um, so I was walking along and I started to pray because I, all of a sudden I was acutely aware that I had turned inwards. And I started to pray. And as I was praying, I, um, I remember just talking to God what I was feeling and I had some anger and I was just talking about all these different emotions I had. And my prayer turned into a prayer of repentance. And um, I was repenting for turning inward, like in my grief. And that may sound harsh to some people, I don't know, but I only think it sounds harsh if we don't understand repentance for like the beauty that it is. And Pastor Brad does a great job explaining how beautiful repentance is because he, he, always, he simplifies it down to saying, where's Jesus? Like when we repent, we're just asking, where's Jesus? And that's really what I was doing that, that morning. And when I was done with my prayer, I looked up and I opened my eyes. Um, it wasn't even really a long prayer. And all of a sudden, I looked up and I saw that the morning sky, the sun was coming up and the sky was turning pink, like all these beautiful shades. 
and the birds were awake and they were singing and it sounded like it was all around me and the there was that warm August breeze <laughs> and it was like on my cheeks and it was in my hair and if you know me well enough or if you heard me on here enough you know that I talk about those things and those are some of my favorite things and it was like all of a sudden it was like I could see it's like I could see that um that he was with me that he'd always been there and that his grace was there that even if I turned away that even if I had been turned inside he never was that what was true was that um, the grace was always there. And um, and as I finished that prayer and as I looked up, it was as if I was reminded. It felt like I hadn't seen the sunrise in forever. I hadn't heard the birds in so long. And I hadn't felt that breeze in a really long time is what it felt like. And so um, I just wanna remind you that his grace is always there. Um, that's what's true and that's what's real because grace is a person. It's Jesus. And it's never ever because grace itself grows dim. Um, for me, it's always because I turn myself where I can't see it. Um, and I just, oh, I do want to close with this last quote and I'm probably out of time here. So let me just close with this last quote. This is actually from the general at the dinner table of the story that I told you from Babette's feast. And this is what the general actually says at the table. So while all the grace is happening and the magic at that dinner table from Babette's feast, the general says this, and I'll just close with this little blip here for you. The general says to all these people, we've all been told that grace is to be found in the universe. But in our human foolishness and short-sightedness, we imagine divine grace to be finite. But the moment comes when our eyes are opened and we see and realize that grace is infinite. Grace, my friends, demands nothing from us, but that we shall await it with confidence and acknowledge it in gratitude. It's always there because grace is Jesus and he's always with you and it will never leave you and it'll never forsake you. So, and grace is enough. Grace is enough and grace is everything. Everything is grace. So I just wanted to share that with you this morning. I hope that you have a good day. If you go to Nature Coast Church, I will see you on Sunday. And be blessed. Thank you. Bye.